Well, the first thing you notice about this page is that it's very long. It's probably as long as two ordinary pages. The second thing you would notice is that they're from different versions of it. With a ruler, I cut out, I tear off paragraphs that I've rewritten, and I scotch tape them in. So when I talk about cut and paste, I really am cut and paste. So the, the thing is, they're, they're very long because for some reason, when things are all supposed to be in one mood or something, I find myself scotch taping and putting the stuff all on one page. This page was triggered when I was listening to the tapes. Johnson taped a lot of telephone calls, and he had, in my opinion, forgotten to turn off the tape. And he, at 10.30 one night, he calls a black civil rights leader, Roy Wilkins to ask him some advice. He says he wants to get a good Latino for the Cal a California board, etc., etc. But at the end of the call, it's Christmas Eve, as I recall, or a day or two before Christmas, Johnson says, good night. But Wilkins doesn't hang up. He says, now, Mr. President, may I say just a word for you? Please take care of yourself. And Johnson, you hear him on the phone, he wants to get off the phone and says, I'm going to, I'm going to. And but Wilkins says, please take care of yourself. We need you. And he says, remember, Mr. President, Merry Christmas. And remember, please take care of yourself. Very good, I'll check with him. Now, now, Mr. President, may I say just a word to you? Uh, I hope you're gonna have first a Merry Christmas. Thank you. And Merry Christmas as you can. I hope you get away. All right. You're down in Texas. And I'd like to say this to you. Please take care of yourself. Well, I'm going to. I'm going to. Please take care of yourself. Uh, uh, we need you. Now, I'm, uh, I'm in your corner. All right, Mr. President, thank you so much. And remember, um, Merry Christmas. And remember, please take care of yourself. As I'm listening to it, you say, why did Johnson mean so much to the civil rights leader? that he would repeat it in this earnest, almost begging tone of voice, we need you, please take care of yourself. And you go back through Johnson's whole life, where you say for 20 years in the Senate, he was not only a vote for the South against every civil rights bill, against every anti-lynching bill, every bill for 20 years. And he was not only a Southern vote, but he was a Southern strategist working to defeat the civil rights bill. Then, of course, he changes. He passes the first civil rights bill in, I think, 87 years when he sent a majority leader. And now Jack Kennedy has been assassinated, and he's taken up his civil rights bill as his first priority. So you say, you know, you could use this telephone call to avoid having to spend weeks and weeks telling that whole story of Johnson's change on civil rights, you have to let the reader know that they had always distrusted Johnson, but he had called them all in. And you say, after the civil rights leaders have been there, they come out and talk to themselves, and one of them says a Magnolia accent, a Southern accent, doesn't only mean bigotry. After these conversations, they believed in him. People are always asking me, did Lyndon Johnson always believe in civil rights? My answer is, he always believed in civil rights, even during the 20 years when he was fighting against civil rights. Always, he felt that he had the power, he was going to pass these bills. How do I show that in the context of this one telephone call? Well, in the first volume, when Johnson is young, he has, he's so poor, he has to take off from a college, very poor boy's college anyway, for a year between his sophomore and junior year, and teach in a Mexican, what they call the Mexican school in Texas, but down near the border, where the students are generally uh, the sons of Mexican sharecroppers. And if I could do this right, I can do this with a reference back to that year he spent down there, and I said, the, re the way to show that he always really wanted, really meant to do it, was that he didn't just teach the children, he taught the janitor, a guy named Tomas Coronado. So I, I finished the call, I said, and remember, please take care of yourself. 
Then I wrote, and if Lyndon Johnson dealing with these leaders about matters which concerned at bottom the color of their skin, if Johnson was fooling these men, he was fooling men who were, where color was concerned, very hard to fool, wasn't posturing. No television cameras had been on him. No reporter taking down his words when he had sat on the steps of the Mexican school with Tomas Coronado. So I try in this one call to show the whole evolution and the sincerity of Lyndon Johnson. I'm always trying to say that what I believe is that if people, if you want people to read nonfiction, history, biography, it has to be written on the same level and with the same care as great works of fiction. <laughs>